I think this is going to be a short week for many people. Uh, I do know a few of us are still on vacation. So let's see if there's any requests on the Slack. I just got started. Um, so see what we have today. We want to go a few round of introduction. I missed a few meetings, so if I don't see you in previous meetings, I apologize. And maybe this time we can use it for introduction. Hello. Yeah. This is Deep, and I think I'm attending since uh, last one, and have okay. lately started working on this security paper. So I work uh, with the tax security folks. And now uh, just attending this because Adele had posted a security paper issue and I'm sort of working on that one. All right. Thank you for joining. And I'll see a few folks. Amisha, if you are, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Nimisha. Uh, I, this is my second meeting that I'm attending. I attended the previous one as well. Um, okay. I work at uh, Confluent and um, I was wanting to contribute to the security paper as well. Uh, and I, I even, I just wanted to get involved generally in all the, uh, you know, some of the projects that you have with the working group. I was ex exploring this week. Uh, I made a PR in Kate SGPT for adding Cilium integration that needs review. So I just added that um, to the new business thing. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. I'm in Seattle. Yeah, so west coast of the US. Cool. Uh, Cameron. Hi there. Uh, this is also my second meeting. Last one was my first one. So uh, I'm with Namisha. I met uh, Ron Petty in Paris at the AI Dev Conference and uh, finally made it to the meeting. So um, I have a business called Cloudacious that, that uh, just working on figuring out what we're doing right now with AI stuff. And uh, so interested in the uh, Kubernetes space with AI, uh, AI workload. So I, I was MLOps before and um, yeah, happy to be here just uh, flying the wall more than anything. That's great. We love to have newcomers. Um, thank you. Uh, VJ. Hey, um, I'm uh, VJ uh, Rodriguez. Um, I live in Lisbon. I work on the Azure Kubernetes um, service, AKS uh, serviceability in Microsoft. And yeah, just listening in for today. Yeah, we love your uh, scheduling of paper. Thanks. All right. Um, so I think uh, we are missing some of the key uh, stake stakeholders here, and we 
have some of the ideas about what uh, is going on in the community. There's a few papers being circulated for finalization. Um, so one of the you know the security paper, white paper. I think the scheduling paper is already out, and there's a sustainability AI, sustainable AI white papers. Uh, still looking for inputs. Uh, this is in very good, is in relatively good shape. Uh, we also aim for the KubeCon period for publication. Um, other than that, I do not have any uh, good uh, good tracking of what is going on. I know there's a people uh, tracking the multi agents architecture. Um, I do have some follow up with that um, uh, agents compute agentic computing as well. So my very rough takeaway is that uh, the agents technology is moving very fast, uh, but there's no, or let's just say there's very little um, relation with what is going on with the CNCF ecosystem. Uh, for example, you uh, if you want to create agents on Kubernetes or using the uh, service functions in Kubernetes, there's no ready to use frameworks or tool chains to enable you to do that. You can use this on your laptop, you can use this on the cloud, uh, but unfortunately, I do not see that it's uh, getting anywhere close to production mm -hmm. in Kubernetes at the moment. So that is uh, something we potentially can create a working group or you know study group on that direction. Um, the Qflow and model training, model serving, this part has been uh, going on very well. So there's a multiple working groups within CNCF as well as the Kubernetes on model serving. Um, uh, that is good news. Um, uh, but uh, the communication, you know, between different working groups, um, I'm still trying to catch up with what is going on right now, uh, because there are so many projects and so many communities. It's very hard to get into all these insights uh, from very high level. Uh, potentially, uh, good news is uh, since we are AI work group, we can use in AI to make summarizations or making comments on these progresses, so every one of us can have a uh, updates. Uh, news with what is happening within multiple working groups. Um, so hopefully that is uh, something we can hear. And I see also Andre is here. Do you mind just uh, give a quick update with uh, the V2 API? Uh, we know this is a proposal has been going on, but uh, if that's something uh, exciting news you can share with us, that'd be great. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so do do I need to speak? I, I know that uh, Ita have a first topic, right, for multi agent architecture. Uh, we don't see him here. Yeah. Did we announce it on the Slack channel? We're gonna have a meeting. No, uh, I see uh, there was some messages over there, but I did not see his um, announcements or any kinds of uh, information over there. But anyway, I don't think that's a stand standard per se. There's a lot of frameworks. But I don't see that as an industrial level standards. Um... Yeah, let me pick at least Ron and um, uh, Adele if he can join us. Yeah. So if we are going to have the agents computing uh, in CNCF or just cloud native space, we can explore that direction as a separate effort. Uh, but right now, uh, to be honest, I think. Uh, we are kind of stretched out on multiple directions already. So maybe once we are wrapped up with the current white paper project, then we can start working on these multi-agent architectures. And this is one of the areas I see CNCF communities very weak because we do not really have a, how to say that? We do not have this, uh, let's say the tool chains, uh, just relevant components that we are supposed to agent architecture. Oh, sorry, I forgot there's a Karen here. So if I don't, if you don't mind, just uh, would you mind just introduce yourself? Or maybe next time. So would you like to take as a, uh, the agent's white paper or investigation as an action item? once we have three cycles with all these um, white paper projects? I will just uh, put as a question mark 
and we can revisit this topic in the next time. Interesting. Right. Oh, let me just uh, see if we can just come list all these existing white papers. Oh, VJ, um, what's the current status of the scheduling? Is that already done or just uh, still in progress? I can see we on the call. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. yeah, Andre. Uh, yeah, uh, what I know is still in progress, and it's it's uh, there is a new process, but uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about what I know about the process. So, Andre, if you know anything more, feel free to. No, they all didn't. I mean, they don't tell. Me, they didn't tell me anything. Um, do you know like, who is leading this process? I think uh, um, Ron was there. Milia was there. I was not following. Uh, are you talking about security white paper? Yeah. No, oh, I think we took... No, so, sorry. No, no, sorry. Scheduling. Scheduling, Sch right? Schedule. Yeah, scheduling. Yeah. yeah, maybe Ronald uh, knows about the process, uh, Andre, but uh, yeah. Not sure. Uh, okay. the, yeah, that was what I last knew. Great. Thank you. Next one, security. That is one I have not actually got in touch with. Is that just a purely for security or security and uh, safety? If that's just for security. Right. So, so let me just, uh, uh, what we call, in the chat, uh, give you the link. So this is uh, actually an old issue. This this particular thing uh, is going on. Uh, I mean, it was raised in by Adel uh, two years ago. And this was posted about a month ago in um, tax security. That's how I came to know. Uh, so this paper, uh, uh, we restarted in, in our last meeting, you could say. And I have some uh, done some groundwork. Nimisha actually has also started. Uh, we have not made progress, much progress. But uh, I thought of uh, if Ron is here, I have to ask a few things because uh, uh, similar, like, overlapping projects are going on uh, multiple places. And I did my research. I think this security paper still makes sense, absolutely. But uh, what I could not see is that uh, uh, the issues which actually Adele has mentioned there, whether it needs to be streamlined based upon those or not. So our Slack channel, I'm going to post my findings, what I have, what I don't have, and we will go from there. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, so. Here is actually a project. Uh, let me just post that as well. So you will see. Just a minute. So in the chat, you see this bunch of bunch of stuff. But you in the useful resources, you will see the first one. And uh, open access of folks are also doing bits and pieces, a few things. And then bunch of uh, information is already available in you know respective bucket. If you see in the chat, uh, the first one is more important in the useful resources. So yeah, so basically, whoever is working, I think as of now, uh, I and Nimisha certainly intend to work on this one. And then we have to go through and see exactly what all we need to cover in the cloud native white paper. And then we have to go from there basically. Uh, so, uh, I do not follow security very well, but I see, think. It is, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, this is per okay. deep actually. Okay. 
So this is done some cloud native angles of the AI angles in there, and there's an AI security and privacy. Yeah, so, so basically, you can see. A... Go ahead. Okay. I will also add this um, to the discussion. Um, potentially, this is not. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, I have spoken to OpenSSL uh, SSF, uh, AIML group. And then uh, I had raised this issue in the uh, tax security, and I have been told that uh, uh, just cut paste my fi finding to basically tax security baseline group, which generally does the, this kind of work. And we'll go from there. And we, if we have to coalesce or actually join something together, it can be done. So I just fi actually finished my research yesterday. So today I'm going to take that step. So this is going to be publicized to tax security baseline, tax security, and I'm going to tag some open SSF folks and this group folks to see uh, if something needs to be put together or we actually go for because this was set, like I said, two years ago. So we have to see what we have to uh, do exactly here. Right. Um, I, will, I think Emily Fox, would be one of the best contacts we have uh, in this area. I will check with her after the meeting. Sorry, who can you write the name here? Who did you Emily say? Fox. She's just. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. I know her. Yeah. 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 Yep. All right. Do you want to reach out to her directly, or just I can? Yeah, check I think she well. was there in one of the meetings. So yeah, I think I yeah I will reach out. Okay. All right. Please. Uh... Deep. Deep. Oh, sorry. I uh, had a very tough time on Fridays. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, we also have the... Um... It's very hard. Sustainable AI. Let me see. So the white paper is already included many of the developments out there. Let me see if I can find the white paper. Uh, if that's something you can contribute to, that'd be great. Uh, we have there's a lot of links over there, and there's also a persona uh, in question. So if you are able to guess up the persona, um, and also the open questions, clarify that'd be great. Okay. So that is also good discussions. We have all the progresses here and there's uh, some future plans. But uh, we do see uh, uh, this is another, it's a kind of slow season, but hopefully the after vacation season is done, we can pick up the momentum. Right. Anything uh, from the team here? If not, happy Friday and have a good weekend. We will see each other in two weeks. Uh, I have a good question. Can I ask a... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So help me understand because uh, uh, I'm just working with uh, CNCF and now lately OpenSSL last couple of months. So if OpenSSL SSF folks have this AML security uh, group and now we have here where uh, we are doing something and then CNCF tax security, etc. Is there any coordination or synergy between OpenSSF and CNCF group, or uh, how does it work? I think Emily has already um, has previously worked in that scenario as well. Uh, I believe she will have the better directions than I can give. Uh, but I uh, heard a few times that uh, OpenSSF has collaborations with CNCF, so I don't think that it's a problem. I would rather see that as a converging opportunities. Okay. Andre? Uh, yeah, I'm just like curious. Uh, so my topic, uh, do you want me to talk about it right now? I mean, maybe I just need, you know, 10 minutes or um, 
I know yeah, we record. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, if you want to, we can definitely talk it next week. But what do you think? I mean, um, I'm not in a rush. We still got hours. I got a full hour here. So um, if you don't mind, okay. we can definitely uh, use this opportunity. I can give the share, uh, sharing to you so you can go ahead and share. Okay. I know we also have some topic from the mission, right? But we're planning to discuss it next time, right? About the KSGBT. Uh, my topic is more like a request for a review, actually. Yeah, I, I just started okay. uh, working on a Cilium integration in Kato's GPT. So if anyone has cycles to review, feel free to uh, do that. Thanks. All right, then let me maybe have a quick discussion about what we're doing on the training side there. Um, yeah, I can, I can share my screen. So let me first introduce myself. So for anyone else who just uh, don't see me. So I'm Andre, I work at Apple. Um, I'm actually from the Qflow community. Been there for the last six years, mostly doing training side of things, uh, model optimization, but uh, contributing to many areas for cloud native AML. Uh, right now on the steering committee of Qflow. So managing this project and trying to help other folks within Kubernetes and since I'm working up to help to understand how to run ML workloads on Kubernetes. Um, so I just today I just want to share what we've been working on for the last um, couple of months uh, with a concerted effort between Kubernetes Batch Working Group and Kubeflow Training Working Group. So in the last KubeCon in 2024 in Paris, we met with a few folks from the Batch Working Group community, and we know that they started a new project called Jobset which basically allows you to manage a group of uh, jobs within the single workload, uh, which basically kind of um, continue the story on, story around how to do distributed training on top of Kubernetes. Um, and we've been like uh, collaborating with them to see how this can be useful for MPI workload, for PyTorch workload, and for other type of workload when you want to do training or fine tuning or any other sort of batch processing on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so let me maybe share my screen to share what we came up with. Uh, so before I jump to this, let me just give you a you know, sh quick reminder. So for all of you who don't know, like Qflow is the ecosystem of multiple sub-projects. You know, we have uh, different open source projects which solve every step of my life cycle. So for example, we have a project for pipelines called Qflow pipelines, we have a notebooks for interactive ID, also have a project like KSOR for model serving, uh, KDIP for hyperparameter optimization, Spark operator, recently also joined Qflow, like model registry, and the training operator. So I'm not going to talk about all these projects, so I've been only focusing on training operator today. And the main idea of training operator is to provide the API for MLEs and for data scientists to do um, model training or fine tuning. Um, without really understanding the, all the Kubernetes complexities. And the main idea of Qflow, we're trying to stitch all these ML tools and cloud tools together with simple interfaces and allow to leverage all this advanced compute and deploy all these models uh, using the other you know, open source frameworks. So we're not only re renovating the wheel, which is giving you a platform to use those frameworks on the Kubernetes. Um, so as I said, I'm going. I'm not going to share like, you know, all the components so the training operator is a specific component that all the sample is going to be deployed standalone and can be used as a standalone application. And the main idea is just an operator which schedule appropriate resources to do model training or fine tuning. Um, so this is, you know, the background, what we're talking about. Um, and recently, uh, let me open the proposal. Uh, so as I said, um, quite recently, Batch Working Group started this new uh, project called Jobset. And we just try to see how we can collaborate with them between Qflow community, between Kubernetes community to actually deduplicate effort. So our main goal um, overall is to deduplicate de effort and make sure we're providing the, the only single you know, uh, tool for data scientists who want to use Kubernetes for training. And we're going to consolidate effort between uh, you know, what should be part of the job set, 
what should be part of training operator and how we can provide a simple interfaces for all the users to leverage those tools to do training. So I think like the rough idea is to, for those who are not familiar with, with uh, distributed training, usually what you need to do, you need to spin up multiple ports. Within this port, you can spin up multiple GPUs and this port needs to communicate using different communication layers, right? You can use CUDA behind the scenes. It can use SSL for NVIDIA collective communication. It also can use MPI. For different way of communications, right? Also, you can use glue backend. Uh, so it depends on the framework and the technology that you use for training. Uh, but the main idea from the infrastructure uh, standpoint, you just need to spin up uh, the job, which basically spin up multiple ports, and you need to set up a headless service to communicate between um, those workloads. Uh, so I think what we end up with, um, since like the main problem right now of Kubernetes is complexity, especially for data scientists and ML engineers. We want to separate the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure complexities to platform engineers, uh, between platform engineers and data scientists. So the main idea, we're going to have a two new customer source. So the first one called training runtime and the second one called train job. And the main idea, training runtime contains the configuration for your model training or fine tuning. It could have a configuration for port failure policy, success policies, all the required policies that is needed to actually run a large scale distributed training job and all other like, you know, complex configuration, like secrets, volumes, node selectors, node affinity, uh, all of these configurations, which usually data scientists, they don't need to worry about, right? So the main goal from them, and I have my training code, I wanted my training code to scale on multiple machines. So basically we provide uh, these training runtimes, which will be maintained uh, by the Qflow community and also can be adopted by different platform engineers with their requirements. And then we have a resource called train job, which basically provide a list of APIs that data scientists can use to start these uh, jobs on top of Kubernetes. And you will see with examples, like have a very simple uh, list of APIs we just provide a minimal set of configurations, which is required to be modified when you want to start a job. And we also offer the Python SDK for those who just don't want to use kubectl um, with additional um, setup, like pre-building the image, Docker image, or bundle your code to the tarball, and then getting this code in the distributed training workloads. Um, and also, given that we have the flexibility of runtimes, we can, we also are thinking about build, building the LLM runtimes, like basically building the runtimes for uh, all of this model that you have uh, in the hiring phase. And we provide like you the, the configuration, how to do the fine tuning on multiple nodes with multiple workers. So again, as I mentioned to you, runtime is pretty flexible. Uh, so we can define something like this, as you can see on this diagram, which basically we're gonna have a, a single LLM runtime which behind the scenes will utilize three different jobs for uh, storage initialization, like model, pre-model, like pre-trained model download or downloading data set. And then we're going to distribute this uh, data between all those distributed workloads and distributed PyTorch nodes. Uh, and then we're gonna have a training step there and the final step like exporter for model uh, exporting and checkpointing. Uh, we, we kind of like thinking about design of LLM runtimes um, right now, especially for the checkpointing, we were thinking about using sidecar approach uh, because like usually um, you probably want to do checkpointing during your model training or fine tuning, um, which means like we need to have a sidecar or any other slightly similar approach uh, to help uh, with the model exporting. Um, yeah, so before I jump to the API design specifically, any questions so far? Uh, so so uh, you're good, using good. Harvard as a library? For we, which library, sorry? Harvard as a library for managing the MPI jobs? Yeah, so you can use Horovod with MPI, yes. Um, we have MPI controller, basically. So for MPI job, we have a dedicated controller. Which do which do, which does orchestration, uh, so which creates the cost file and creates all the appropriate ports. Uh, but yes, you can use Horobot within MPI uh, jobs. This is possible. So, so how how is it different? Uh, any differences when we use Howard with this and with the solution which which you are so giving? Not all of the. Not all of the users use Horobot, right? So some people use directly Torch Run, or some people maybe use Deep Speed, or some of them using Accelerate from Hugging Face, right? 
so Horowat is just one of the uh, tools to do distributed training, right? Um, right. Yeah, so we support Horowat via MPI uh, because it requires to create MPI run command, right? Behind the scenes, it requires to create a host file. Uh, so the host file creation is part of also of training operator. Um, but yeah, it could be, you know, we have some examples with Horowat and MPI job. Uh, if you're interesting in terms of MPI, actually, I think I didn't mention, but um, we're planning to, uh, so the train job will be single. So previously we have a multiple resources. I like will have a PyTorch job. We have an MPI job. I have a TF job. So all of the jobs will be deprecated and we're going to have a single resource called train job, which basically um, allow us to leverage all of the runtimes for different frameworks. We're going to have MPI runtime. We're going to have like, you know, torch runtime, uh, or T TensorFlow runtime um, with all these configurations required for the specific uh, framework. We also think about Storm runtime as well because we had a like, uh, couple of days ago, we had a, a discussion with the Storm uh, folks from ShedMD and we think about how we can leverage um, the Storm operator for um, for those I runtime guess, as well. I guess Storm also uses MPI as a back, I guess. Uh, I don't think they're using... MPI for communication. Like uh, I know they have a different way of how they communicate between Slurm nodes. Um, sometimes they use MPI, but as far as I, I understand correctly, uh, in initial implementation of Slurm operator, they're not going to use MPI. But I need to double check on this. I'm not 100% sure. Thank you. Thank you for Yeah, Thank no worries. Much. Um, any other questions before I jump to the API design? All right. So I, I will leave this proposal for all of you who are interested to review. Uh, but I think like the main idea, as I mentioned, we're going to separate train job and the runtime between two separate resources, which basically provide a set, set the minimal amount of API that data scientists can use to start to, to actually trigger those jobs. Uh, so one of the examples, so this this cap is, has all the information about why we um, choose the wording of node, what is the difference between these distributed strategies for every framework, um, because eventually, you know, every framework, they have their own distributed backends, like PyTorch has distributed, uh, like uh, PyTorch distributed, TensorFlow has their own distributed library for where they use parameter servers, where they use uh, worker pools, JAX has its own distributed strategy. So basically we try to see how we can unify some of those concepts and provide a very simple API to leverage different frameworks without um, significant changes to the control plane. Uh, so whatever you, you want to use JAX, you want to use hanging phase transformers, or you want to use native PyTorch, you can leverage the same API to do training, right? Um, so I think the main idea, I'm not going to, to like all of the API, but uh, the example of how train job look like is extremely simple. And again, as I mentioned, you can use OopsyTL or you can use Python SDK. So we kind of also offering the training SDK, which kind of streamlined the job submission. Uh, but the idea is you just uh, provide the reference to the runtime uh, and provide the trainer configuration, like what the image you want to use, what are the command you want to use, how many nodes you want to spawn. So the nodes means how many ports you're going to use, right? But every every node or port might have a multiple GPUs, right? Uh, which basically um, uh, distributed uh, training on multiple machines, right? Um, and then behind the scenes, we're going to convert this train job to the torch run command, which do the, the job submission. And as I said, you can use, again, Python SDK, where basically you can define the training function. Uh, where you define your whole of your training loop with uh, your PyTorch model, uh, you go into initialize your backend, and then you just can wrap this function under the container input arguments using the train API, the Python API. So this doesn't even require for you to build an image or worry about how to configure those YAMLs. And how actually the LLM runtime might look like uh, from the from the API perspective, uh, similar to the previous example, you're just going to have a reference to the one of the runtimes like Torch, Tune, Llama 7B, where you specify what data set you want to use 
uh, what model you want to use, and then everything else will be happening behind the scenes. So we're going to also provide uh, some sort of rebuild trainer, which basically do the fine tuning, and also provide this, some sort of data set initializer and model initializer, which which, which will do the uh, initialization of those entities. Um, and this can be very configurable, right? So for example, if you want to use a default data set, you can just pass the model config parameters with your um, input to your model. Um, yeah, so so this again, if you're interested, this has more kind of structure API, which parameters can be configured via train job and going all the way to the runtimes. Let me just um, show you one of the runtimes. Um, yeah, so for example, this one, right? So this, uh, yeah, this pop, pop, pop group policy. Let me show you. Well, for example, this PyTor distributed runtime. So on the runtime perspective, uh, we're planning to have cluster training runtime and the training runtime. So the only difference is with the cluster training runtime is uh, cluster scoped and namespace runtime is names, namespace scoped. So similar to issuer and search manager, if you're familiar with. Uh, and this API has a, like parameters which platform engineers are more familiar. Like for example, they know how to configure failure policies, they know how to configure job template. So here we have a template, which basically a job set template, where you can define every job in your template and you can define all the parameters that is required to start this runtime. And also we have a parameter called ML policy. So here, um, back to the question about MPI, we we supporting different ML policies, uh, different like, you know, framework specific configuration. Like we support Torch specific configuration, like Elastic PyTorch or MPI specific implementation, like MPI uh, type of MPI, MPI implementation and other MPI parameters that can be configured. So one of the examples can be seen, um, uh, where is it? right here like for example uh, in mpi we can specify what what type of mpi you want to use and what how many like processes per node you want to use like for example this parameter like numproc per node is actually how many gpus you have on every node and if you want to parallelize it uh, across a single node right so these parameters also can be leveraged um yeah so i think the last thing maybe i want to show you is how the lm runtime might look like uh, one second so model yeah i think this one um so this is still under progress so we're still trying to see how we can define this exporter job and initializer job but i think the rough idea is to have this template where basically uh platform engineers will define um the steps of uh, initialization training and exporting so we're trying to work with the batch working group community to see how we can uh, define the order of the jobs because usually you don't want to waste your GPU resources on the model initialization and the data set initialization. So this is required for us to split it between uh, initializer job, which basically will do the data set initialization, model initialization, and then the node job, which do actually the training. Uh, so here we, again, we have a job for, for, we have a container for data set initialization, container for model, like pre-trained model initialization. And then we have a job for actually training where user can configure like LoRa config, can configure the um, uh, the transformer parameters, like trainer parameters, trainer arguments. And this trainer also will be pre-created uh, behind, the, behind the scenes for the user. So they don't really, if, if they, if they just want to use default parameters, they don't, they can just use the default trainer. But sometimes user wants to, we, we hear the, the feedback from users, they want to have more flexibility sometimes, even during the fine tuning. So some users, uh, for example, they want to modify the layers of the model, or maybe they want to add another layer to the existing model. And sometimes users just want to say, hey, I have this, you know, uh, this uh, Mistral model that I want to fine tune on my data set without any changes. So we want to try to understand what kind of flexibility we want to give to the user, but at the same time, give them a quick API so they can iterate faster on their uh, fine tuning experiments. Um, yeah, and also we have a finalization. Of, this is not finalized yet, but I think as I mentioned before, maybe we will use a sidecar approach. But the rough idea is like when you finish your fine tuning, you could just need to export your model to the blob storage or to the model registry um, when you're going to use this model for serving.
uh, alpha inference, right? Yeah, so any questions? Uh, um, I, I don't go through all the APIs, but just want to give you a rough idea of what we're trying to do right now. The initialization can be an uh, init container as well, right? Yeah, that's true. We, yes. I think the main idea for us is to thinking about not wasting GPU. So we don't want to use init containers because in that case, your trainer will waste the GPU, right? Uh, because if you define your initialization as part of init container, you still need to have a GPU uh, for the training uh, where on, on the master node, right? So talking about if you have like a master node with init container, right? Um, and the container for the training. Or are you talking about something else here, Karen? Yeah, so uh, I was thinking like it'll it'll just initialize the model and the data set. So okay. it will it will just start before the training node, training uh, pod. So yep. uh, like training container within a pod. So yep. I was thinking that uh, how it will be running as a init container and how the resources are being distributed, uh, like being utilized. Um, when we do this as a set, yeah. Yeah, so I think the pro yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I was, I, I was, I was thinking that this is an init container that it will start and finish it. And then the whole operation, the whole, um, data, the whole idea goes to, uh, to the training node, training container. Yeah, but we still need to split it between different pods, right? Because yeah. like when you when you start Sorry. a port, yeah, good. Right. So I was thinking that uh, these all uh, pods will be using uh, multiple uh, instances of this init containers, and then it will st start using the main container, which is the training container. So yeah, that's right. So the the, the problem with this approach that you might have like you know uh, hundreds of different you know containers, hundreds of different nodes. And every node doesn't need to have this init container, right? Because you need to have a single, you know, process which download your model and data set, right? And then you need to distribute it, right? Using the shareable PVC, right? Um, and uh, or some sort of distributed data between all of your workloads, right? Um, so, and the problem is, yeah, there is there are another approach using init containers on the master node. So, user in distributed training, right? You have your master node. And the and the worker nodes, right? So one of the examples I think we have right here. Um, so yeah, I think in the in the in the TensorFlow example, I think it will be easier to understand. So yeah, not not in the all reduced example, but I think the I think usually the worker zero is the master master worker, and all the workers, you know, like the, the like the the basically uh, um, uh, the other workers with different ranks. So you can do initialization on the master node, and then you can start all of other po other pods. The problem with this approach is that when you do the init container approach with with the, inside this uh, master master pod, you will still uh, use this GPU. You will still kind of uh, allocate this GPU to this pod when you do initialization. So we want to avoid it because uh, initialization might take you know for example a couple of maybe one hour, right? If your model is very large, right? And we don't want to lock this GPU once we do the initialization. That is why I want to split it between another job which just that which 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 just does initialization, and then the job which basically will spin up all those workers or all the nodes to do the training. Right? Um, that makes sense. So this, yeah, this job will be running on other nodes, right? The initialization. Yes. Yeah, it's, it will be running in a separate job. So jobs are basically managing multiple like batch jobs, right? So we have a job for initialization, we have a job for training, and then we have a job for exporting, right? Um, so it's like a separate job that you run, and behind it, after the job, it will spawn the single pod, which will do initialization, right? Yep. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think we also try to see how we can leverage the gang scheduling. I think if you're interesting, we have this API called pod group policy API, which basically allows us to only schedule the job when all the GPUs are available. So we try to leverage, leverage Unicorn, Volcano, also like cost scheduling plugins for this kind of approach. So I think the rough idea is here that you only want to start your distributed training job when all of your GPUs are available. 
otherwise it will still be in the pending state um so this is one of thing we we also trying to see how we can leverage this ml policy api and pod group policy api for this type of things um and i think also i didn't mention about um, uh, the elastic pytorch so in the existing training v1 api we support pytorch elastic which basically create a hp horizontal pop out of the scalar to scale up and scale down pytorch nodes so with these runtimes we are planning to implement this as part of um, elastic policy inside the torch ml policy uh, so PyTorch, it supports elasticity via Torch run. So you can specify min and man number of nodes. And I think behind this is using rendezvous backends to actually scale up and down your training nodes. So we're also trying to see how we can leverage those APIs within uh, those runtimes and the um, training operator, which provides more flexibility, especially for like large-scale large scale, uh, distributed training jobs. Um, Right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you then. Um, let me know. So we have a lot of tasks to do. Like if you want to be involved in the Qflow community or in general and training operator, let me know. I can definitely, you know, like uh, let us know about our regular calls and also the work which we're planning to do on the Kubernetes side and also on the training operator side. So there are some caps we planning to submit to the Kubernetes directly uh, so we can imp implement these features because all this we're trying to also integrate with Q, with a job set, with jobs. Uh, so try to see how we can provide a better platform for actually users to use Kubernetes for training, right? Because there are still some gaps within the batch jobs and Kubernetes, which unfortunately doesn't give ideal experience for training. This is why some people don't use Kubernetes for model training, maybe just do directly better metal their own technologies, right? Um, yeah, so let me know, All right? Thanks, thanks, Andre. Yeah, thank you, I mean, like I think we, we have done, like if we had to have any other discussions, Oh, thank you. I just muted myself. Um, this is a very uh, comprehensive overview for myself as well. Um, so just a very quick question. I just uh, quickly uh, browsed while we are talking the Python uh, SDK. Yep. Uh, it looks like there's a Python SDK for Qflow just for pipeline. Do you also have the one for um, serving? Yeah, we have one for training. So we have KFP is the Qflow pipelines SDK. Qflow training oh. is the one for training. And the case server, I think they all they those have the SDK. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. I will check the case server community. Thank you for the information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. KFP, so Qflow also KFP is separate, and the Qflow training is also separate. So, uh, ah, yeah. okay, nice. That makes sense. That's yeah. So the one so that I'm talking about, the, yeah, 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 and the one that I'm talking about is about the training, right? So we try to see how we can you know leverage this SDK to streamline this uh, training experience, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for all this information. And it's great to see everybody on this very nice Friday. See you in two Thank weeks. Thank you. Yep. See you soon. See you around. Bye bye.